Good morning and welcome. Uh, as we worship our Lord Jesus, we are so excited that you're joining us this morning. Uh, church is open, just so you know. Church is open, and we're excited to see uh, folks returning um, to church. And uh, we want to take this opportunity to invite you to, uh, to return worship to worship with us. Uh, Pastor Mike has our message this morning entitled, Keep Your Eye on the Cross. But before we get there, I have just another announcement for you. I want to give you an update on our preschool and um, our expansion project. Uh, for the month of September, we were able to raise $22,334, bringing us to a grand total of 453625 that leaves us a balance of 166000 minus the matching fund. We need to raise $83,000, and uh, that's 41000 for the month of October and November, and we can do it. We can do it. So uh, keep that in your prayers, and uh, if you can help, that would be awesome. Uh, be sure to sign up for our e-news. There you're going to see all kinds of information, including uh, a video with our town hall meeting and um, register your attendance. And I invite you to join your hearts and minds with me now as we worship our Lord Jesus. our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce God's grace to all of you. And in this stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I had the privilege to tell you that all of your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. O God, the, pro the protector of all who trust in you, have mercy on us that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through the things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for today, which is the basis for our meditation, is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you 
because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is the word of the Lord. And our Lord's grace and his mercy and his peace and his constant love and joy be yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Dear family, so I I remember back in high school that that one of our teachers, that was our science teacher, he gave us this experiment that he wanted us to go through, and it was designed to help us to be more aware of using our senses you know, touch and smell and taste and so on. He wanted us to make sure we just didn't go outside and experience something and just see it and that was it. He, he really wanted us to heighten our senses. So what he did is he gave us a cigar box. And in, in that cigar box were certain objects. And our job was to use all of the senses that we could to try to determine what objects were in the box and how they were arranged. Now, if you think like me, you go, well, it'd be really easy just to lift up the box and see, (laughs) because then you'd have the whole picture. Well, he nailed the the top shot, (laughs) so we couldn't do that. So you could could use your sense of hearing as as you kind of tilted the box. Was there an object in there that rolled, or did it kind of bounce or what was going on there. So you you really tried to hear what was happening. Or if something did kind of roll, you could you know, put your fingers along the bottom to see, well, is this a heavy object or did it roll the length of the box or, you know, stuff like that. Or or you could use your sense of smell to kind of smell. Is there is there like a strange scent in there, or, or is there maybe uh, some kind of perfume or cologne aftershave or something in there, or is there a particular smell that's involved there? And so we went through that experiment. I wrote all my stuff down, handed it in. Couldn't wait to get it back because I really wanted to find out, did I do a good job and was I right about the objects in the box? And we got our papers back. There was a grade on it, but we never knew what was in the box and how those objects were arranged. Now you might say, Mike, if you got an A, then you must have got all the objects right and everything. No, no, no. It was, the grade was more based on your, obs- your sense of observation and, 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 and how you used your other senses in order to make evaluations about what was in the box. So we never knew. I wanted to know the whole picture. I never got to know the whole picture. Well, to me, that sounds a bit like life. You ever have things happening in your life and you don't understand why? Why in the world did this happen? What it, what's going on here? I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And yet it's happening. And usually we ask that question when it's something bad. It's just not good. It, we don't know why the bad things are happening in our life the way that they are. I mean, I mean, it, it's just kind of crazy. We, we make plans for our life. We arrange how we want things to work and go in our life. And then all of a sudden, bam, something hits us, a bad situation, a circumstance, whatever it is. And we go, what's going on here? 
You know, it's almost like me looking in, you know, or trying to figure out what objects were in that box and how they were arranged. And it was frustrating because I never knew. So in our lives, we don't always know why things are happening the way that they are and how it's all going to work out because we can't see the total picture. And sometimes when that happens, we begin to think it's our fault. And, and, haven't you ever heard of people who have said, you know, when my parents got divorced, I, I figured it was my fault. I, I had something to do with it. It must have been something I said or did that caused them to get divorced because when this bad thing happened, you just can't figure out why and you go, it, maybe it's me. Or, or, or maybe if you've been abused, you might say, you know, maybe I did something to cause that to happen. Something I did, something I said, a certain behavior or whatever it is. I, I can't remember, but it, maybe it was my fault. Or somebody thinks, I've got cancer, but maybe I've got cancer because I ate the wrong foods. Maybe I didn't eat enough broccoli or vegetables or whatever it was that you say, or maybe I didn't take enough vitamins or maybe my lifestyle isn't right and I brought it on and maybe it's my fault because we just don't understand why things happen the way that they do. Or we could take the opposite view of that and we might say, God, why why aren't you listening to me? If you just work it out this way in my life. And if you just arrange things in my life to happen this way, we could get out of this situation and we'd be okay. So are you listening to me, God? I mean, God, we, we, you could do this. Just, just listen to me and do it. That, that dangerous thinking too, isn't it? The items in the cigar box, the things that happen in our life, we don't always understand why things are happening the way that they are, why this dark cloud has to be over my head. So what do we do? Well, I look at our text. Look at the Thessalonian church and the people that were involved with the Thessalonian church. These are obviously fairly new Christians, but as it says in the text, they they were involved in idol worship They were involved with some immoral living and those kinds of things. But because they heard the good news of Jesus, the spirit through the word worked faith in their hearts. And they they changed from that. They were transformed from that to now believing in their Lord and Savior Jesus and giving their life to him instead of to idols, instead of to immoral living. But because of that, they lost friends. They underwent, as you read in the text, severe persecution. I would imagine some of that would be social persecution and political persecution. And it would have been easy to have been in their place and said, God, I I just have my life transformed by your good news. I want to live for you. And and it's just such good news. Why are all these bad things happening? Are you, why are you allowing these bad things to happen to me when, when I'm trying to live for you? It would have been easy for them to say that. But Paul says, no, instead they, they imitated Paul and, and they stood firm in their faith. In fact, verse three Verse 3 says, your actions on behalf of the true faith, your tireless toil of love, and your unfailing, unwavering, unending hope in our Lord Jesus, the anointed. That's how Paul described the faith of the Thessalonians, even in the midst of persecution. And by the way, I love that part of the phrase, your unfailing, unwavering, unending hope in our Lord Jesus. It's like no matter what's going to come at you, these folks are going to stand firm in the faith of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's like there's no way you're going to get them to change. 
but we don't always know the whole picture. I couldn't lift up the box on that cigar box and see how everything fit together. We can't lift up, if you will, the cover of our lives and and see our entire life before us and how God works things out and what's going to happen. And just because this bad thing happens doesn't mean that everything is lost and it's all gone because God can change those things because he promises to work all things out for our good. I want to show you a little video about that. And um, let me kind of set that up for you. It's a short video. So please pay attention. It's, it's the last shot in a soccer game. It's, but it's the penalty shot. And so you're you're only going to see the shooter, the officials and, and the goalie. And so the setup is if the shooter If he shoots this ball, if he kicks this ball and it goes in the net, then the shooter's team wins, they celebrate and go crazy. On the other hand, if the keeper, if he's able to deflect the ball, catch the ball, or the shooter misses the net altogether, then the keeper's team wins and and they go crazy. Well, let's see exactly what happened in this video. Wow. Did, did, did you catch all that on the video? I, I don't know if your eye was quick enough to see it. I mean, I had to see it a couple times, but when the shooter kicked the ball, the, the keeper didn't touch it. It hit the, the bar on, on the top of the net and it bounced off the bar and it went straight up. Well, at that point, the shooter's thinking, we've lost. I failed. It's my fault. I kicked it wrong. And our team is now lost. He was down, out, and just, you know, he knew he messed up. On the other hand, um, the keeper, he's like, yes, the ball didn't get in. And he's running out with his hands up and celebrating because they won. But because nobody touched the ball... The ball went straight up, it stayed in bounds, it came back down, and it had some spin on it, and it went right back into the net. And suddenly, everything changed. The shooter now went down on his knees like, I can't believe this, how things turned around, we, we now have won. And of course, the keeper is like, I can't believe this happened, we just lost. I mean, something happened that nobody could have predicted, and it turned out in a way that nobody could have imagined. Just unbelievable how it happened. How often doesn't that happen in our lives as well? And in fact, it may be happening right now to you because you're just not understanding why things are happening the way that they are in your lives. I mean, we're doing our best to follow the Lord, to read our Bibles, to go to church, to worship Him, as we talked about last week, to have an active prayer life, and we're doing all of those things, and all of a sudden, something happens, and we go, why? Why why is this happening to me me now? I've been reading my Bible and doing all of these things. We might even be tempted to say, God, what are you thinking? I mean, look at, look at my life and look what's happening and how I'm trying to follow you, just like the Thessalonians. You know, look how like, they changed their lives. They transformed them. They totally gave up things in order to follow the Lord God, and yet they were under severe persecution. So in our life, we might be going along following the Lord and something happens and we don't understand. We're almost like the shooter initially who thinks, oh, I failed. I don't understand. I thought I shot the ball right. I thought I was going to get it in the net, and I failed. 
but it turned out totally different. I'm telling you, folks, our Lord is not going to drop us. He's not going to let us go. He's always going to have us in his hands. He's going to work things out for our good, no matter how bad it may seem at the time. Things may not get resolved in our way, but he's not going to let us go. And so you might say, well, okay, well, Mike, uh, listen here. If I pray and pray and pray that, that, that my loved one gets healed, but my loved one doesn't get healed and they die, you tell me how in the world that's, that, that's God working all things out for my good and for the good of my loved one. And I would say, I've been through that. I understand that. My wife and I prayed and prayed and prayed that our daughter would be healed of cancer. And she was a follower of Jesus Christ. She didn't survive. She died. But my next question to you would be, where do you think she is now? She's in heaven. Can you think of a better place for anybody to be right now? I'm not saying we don't miss her. I'm not saying that we don't wish she was right here, right now with us, laughing and having a good time. I'm not saying that we don't, we don't grieve and that we don't cry because we do and it hurts. But we also realize she's with Jesus right now. And, and, here's, and here's the point. If you, saw us, if you saw us last week and you worshiped with us last week, you remember one of the key points we made was that serving is not a transaction, but it is a process. A lot of people remember that. Here's something to remember from today and for the situation that I'm just talking about. Jesus did not come to primarily take care of our earthly problems. Let that sink in. He didn't come primarily to take care of our earthly problems. He's not our genie in the bottle. He, he's not the one that we go to that no matter what happens in our life that's bad, we can go to him and, and, and all of a sudden he'll make it the way we want it to be. He's not that genie in the bottle. If, if you're, um, shouldn't say it, but if you're my age, right, you might remember the TV show, right? I Dream of Genie when they could go to the genie in the bottle, right? And genie would take care of everything. Well, we don't, we, we don't have God in the bottle, right? That's not what he's here for. If he was here to only take care of our earthly problems so that no matter what that problem was, he would take care of it the way we wanted it to be taken care of. Listen, we'd still die because of sin, because nobody had paid the price for sin. And if nobody pays the price for sin and we die, then we suffer eternal damnation. I don't want that. Instead, Instead, Jesus came for a different reason. Instead, Jesus came primarily to take care of the biggest problem that you and I will ever experience in our entire life, eternity. And what I mean by that is this. He came to take care of sin. He came to pay the price for sin so that you and I could spend eternity with him. That's why he came as one of us. That's why he lived a perfect life. That's why he allowed the Romans to take him to the cross and, and put spikes in him in the cross. That's why he endured suffering for you and I on the cross. So he could pay the price for our sin. And it killed him. He went to the grave. And he was dead, but he defeated sin, he defeated death, he defeated Satan, he rose from the dead, and he comes out and gives us that free gift of forgiveness for our sins, encouragement for our life, and eternal life with him. He came so that that crazy disease that we call cancer that took our child's life, 
He came so that Ashley could live with him in heaven forever and ever and ever. I know that we are finite creatures and we can't even imagine what eternity is like, but it never ends. It always goes on. But because he came primarily to take care of our biggest problem of of eternity, that doesn't mean that he has nothing to do with our lives every day. He does. He does work things out for our good. He does answer prayer. I have seen so many prayers answered, and and you have too. And, And by the way, he does answer all prayers. They may be no, it may be wait, it may be yes. But I have seen him answer prayers, and work things out. And I'm sure you have too. Our God will never drop us or let us go. He will always work things out. That was the faith that the Thessalonians had. That was the faith that Paul had. And they kept that faith. And they knew that even in the midst of persecution and severe suffering, God was still with them. And God was watching over them. And he had already worked out the biggest problem that they would have ever experienced in their life. Don't despair. Don't give up when things don't look like they're working out right. Don't give up when you got the black cloud over your head and you can't understand why bad things are happening to us. I know we live in a fractured, broken world. But our God, he came to grant us that forgiveness that we need, the encouragement that we need from him, his 24-7 presence, and eternal life with him. So here's a couple of quick takeaways. First of all, God is saying, stand firm. He's saying, I've got this. No matter what you're going through, no matter how bad it may seem, no matter if you can't see what's going to happen or how you can even get out of this, stand firm because our God has got it and he's not going to let you go. No problem, no situation, no bad experience is bigger than our God. He's bigger than all of that and he's got it all together. And as I said before, if we could lift the lid of our, our lives and, and see our entire lives, we could see how things were arranged and working out and what was going to happen and how God was going to bring about good even from what is bad. And the second thing, your witness of faith, you standing firm and being the hands and feet of Jesus, even in the midst of adversity and suffering and persecution and pain, that witness encourages other people. You heard that in our text when Paul said, People, people knew about your witness. It was an encouragement, an inspiration. It built them up. It lifted them up. You know, remember, folks, they didn't have iPhones. They, did, they didn't have texting. They, they didn't have Twitter and all that kind of stuff back then. They needed these stories to be told and to be spread around because amidst all the persecution and the suffering and stuff that was going on, they needed stories of people that were standing firm standing firm in the faith and knowing that God was with them, knowing that he was there. So folks, I say, as the title of the sermon says, keep your eye on the cross. Just like that shooter and that keeper should have kept their eye on the ball, right? And they didn't. Keep your eye on the cross. You know, in Hebrews, it even says to keep our eyes on, on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our, of our faith. Keep your eyes on the cross, on Jesus, because he is the one who continues to hold us in his arms. No matter what we go through, he will always be there and never drop us, never let us go, and he will work all things out for our good, and he has already worked out the biggest problem that you and I ever had in our lives. And so I pray that we will continue to stand firm in the faith. I pray that our witness will be an inspiration to other people. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to live in us and build us up and help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to everyone. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
And we continue with our prayers because our prayers are a way of taking not only our requests, but the requests of other people to our God, as well as to thank him for the blessings that we have. And we want to continue to pray, folks, not just today. We want to pray constantly every day. So let's talk to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us and we thank you for watching over us. We thank you for the blessings, so many blessings that you've given us in our lives, chiefly among them that of yourself. Thank you, Lord, for coming not just to work out our earthly problems, but to pay the price for sin, to guarantee that we could be with you forever in eternity, to continue to be with us each and every day. And Lord, just like these folks in Thessalonica were transformed by the Holy Spirit and came to faith, we pray that more and more people today would come to faith in Jesus, that the Holy Spirit would work in their lives through the Word of God and bring more folks to faith in Christ because we want everybody to be saved. So please, Lord, make that happen through the Word. Yes, use us as a hands and feet of Jesus to begin getting that good news into people's lives, but Lord, please bring them to faith. And Lord, as always, we want to pray for folks that are out there on the front lines. We pray for people serving in the military. We continue to pray for firefighters and police officers who often find themselves in very difficult situations where snap decisions need to be made. Please be with them. Give them your wisdom and guidance as well as your protection. We pray for first responders and doctors and nurses who, again, are fighting this virus and many times putting their life on the line, but they also have to be there for the many other medical situations that come up and the things that need to happen. So please be with them and give them your energy and your encouragement. We pray for wisdom for our government leaders. We know the elections around the corner. We know all the stuff that's going on in our country. We know the sides that have been drawn. God, we're just praying for you to to give our government leaders your wisdom and your guidance. Lord, please be with them on the national level, the the, the state level, the local level, and, and be with our government leaders and give them your wisdom and guidance. At the same time, we have people that we want to pray for as well. We pray for Katie, for Jerry, for Megan and Trent, for Allison, for Margaret and Glenn, for Autumn and Bill and Kathy. We pray for Courtney, for Dan, Dave, Denny and Jessica, for Joy and Julie, for Corey, Christy, for Lorraine, for Mark, Missy, RJ, Ron, pray for Sam, Sarah, Scott, Steve, and Tom. We pray for those that are in our hearts that were not mentioned just now, Lord, that we have contact with in our lives as well. And we also pray, Lord, for anybody that's experienced any kind of um, devastation from this past hurricane that went through, the fires that are going on, the changes in the, in the weather and what that will bring. Just we, just we just pray for people, Lord, that you're with them and that you raise up folks to be the hands and feet of Jesus to them locally, as well as using us, Lord, to do all that we can to assist in any way possible. Father, be with us. Watch over us. We commit all of this to you only in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now please receive the benediction of our Lord. The Eternal One, bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Eternal lift up his countenance upon you and give you his 
peace. Amen.